surround me oh lord surround me oh lord surround This place surround me, oh Lord, oh. surround me, oh Lord. Surround me, oh Lord, let your presence fill this place, let your presence fill this place. Good morning. I want to welcome everyone here this morning as we meet, gather to worship our God. What a beautiful day. What a beautiful day to do that. I want to welcome those folks who are joining us in live stream and video later in the week as well. Um, I'm going to give you an opportunity to just prepare, just to prepare your hearts. Just this time of, of just, uh, uh, just uh, I'm going to allow Ken to play, but just have a time of quiet, time of solitude where you can just go before the Lord and uh, uh, just ask him to remove anything that doesn't need to be there in your minds, in your hearts for this next hour. So give you some time to do that. Father God, we have gathered here today to worship you because of who you are. You are our God. You are our creator and our sustainer. Every good gift that we have comes from you. And we gather here today every week to be reminded of who you are. And so, Lord, as we we sing, as we pray as we open up your word lord we we ask that every part of this service will bring you glory and honor and praise including whatever we think about and we ask these things in the name of jesus christ for the reason we are here and the freedom that we have in his name amen would you stand please i'm going to read from isaiah chapter 40 And the writer Isaiah says this, Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not weary in his understanding. No one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Amen. As we worship our God this morning.
precious name. Glory to his name, precious name. There to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to his name. Oh, precious to his name. Can we shout hallelujah? Amen. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. How many got a different kind of joy since you've been saved? Since you've been born again? Hallelujah. Somebody shout glory in this place. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together. Oh, yeah.
got joy this morning. I don't know about you. But I feel some, some kind of good. Amen. Hallelujah. Bless you, Jesus. You may be seated. We come to our time of prayer this morning. And uh, to begin with, I want to thank uh, everyone who come out. And I did have picture. I was going to put up a picture up on the screen, and I forgot. So you need to tune in to the e-news, and you'll have all the pictures in regards to uh, 
Um, what the folks did, you know, I guess I had to tell you what we're talking about. The uh, 10 of us went down and helped out with some people from the uh, New Fork Baptist Church. There's the old New Fork School um, that was uh, back in the 30s, the first um, African-American school in, in the county. And uh, we kind of cleared the grounds a little bit so that they can begin to restore that church. It's just a good day, a couple hours in the morning. And I just want to appreciate everybody coming out to, to help in that. Um, I also want to thank you uh, for your giving, for your faithfulness in your giving. Um, uh, you all have been so faithful. Um, for instance, we had in the parking lot, we had a chunk that had gotten all tore up because of the trash truck. And so we had to dig it up and get it kind of repaved a little section to the tune of $1,700, by the way. Um, but we're able to do that. We're able to fix that because um, of, you know, we don't have to raise special funds. We don't have to leave it go because you guys are faithful in your giving. And so I just want to start off by saying I thank you uh, for your tithes and your offerings in support of the ministry of this church. Um, as we come to our prayer list, you can see the uh, names that are on her. We want to keep Eldon born in our prayers. She was in, still in rehab at the Colonnades. Uh, talked to David this morning. She's getting, uh, she's getting stronger, moving around on the walker, all around the facility, doing laps. And so that's great for Eldon. And uh, they'll be talking about soon about her next steps and, and uh, when she can come home and what she'll need to do. We want to remember our homebound folks as well. You can see the names that are listed there, and uh, we want to keep those folks in our prayer. Some of those folks are able to watch live stream as well, so that's good. Some are not, but we want to keep them uh, in our prayer. Does anyone else have any prayer requests, anything you'd like to share with us this morning? Adam. Okay. Adam. Mm. Adam has a friend uh, whose wife, his name is Tanya Snow. She's in a, a, a coma as a result of, of a stroke. Did you say? As a result of a stroke, uh, but she is um, has woken up, and and uh, so we continue to pray. So Tanya Snow, we want to remember her in our prayers. Anyone else? Yes. Carolyn. Yeah. Uh, um, Carolyn Westrader's daughter's mother in law. Do you know what is her name? What's the last name again? Donna Tomlin. All right, we will remember Donna in our prayers. All right. Okay, Kay's, Kay's son is doing much better. Awesome. Awesome. We praise God for that. Praise, praise God for healing. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to give you a time of silence. And you can pray whatever you, between you and God, whatever God puts on your heart. And then I will close this in prayer. And then let's read the Lord's Prayer together, which will be in your bulletin, okay? And I'll lead us in that. Father God, hear our prayers as we bring them to you this morning. Father God, we are grateful that we are able to come directly to you um, with our prayers, with our concerns, 
with the things that we are worried about in life and know that you, not only that you hear us, but you, that you care about us. You love us more than we can imagine. That, that is all throughout scripture. And of course, Jesus taught us to call you Abba Father, which is in a way like Daddy, that we come before you uh, with a sense of, of just knowing that you, you uh, we don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops to get to you, that you open, open up your arms wide. And so, we, Lord, we come to you for our own needs. We come to you on behalf of these folks on our prayer list and that have been mentioned here this morning and those even in our, in our minds which come to our minds. Lord, you know the situation, and we pray for healing upon these people. We pray that they would be restored to, to normal health. Lord, we pray that their relationship with you would increase and grow stronger and that they too would, would love you and trust you. Father, we pray for our world in this age of Instant headlines, we are reminded anytime we turn on the news or get on the internet that the, this is a broken and fallen world, a very sinful world. There are wars all over the place. And God, we pray for those just innocent people that are involved in war torn countries. Lord, we know you are not for this. And so we pray that, that peacemakers would arise and that people would humble themselves in leadership to want to get along. Lord, we pray for peace in our world. And, and Lord, may we be peacemakers even in our own nation as there just seems to be skirmishes and we're at each other's throat. Lord, may we not contribute to that, but may the peace of Jesus, the peace that we sang about that, that you have given us, may, may that emanate out from us in the way that we live our lives to change our world, our community, and even our homes, Lord. Father, we ask forgiveness for our sins. We have chosen to do our own thing and to go our own way. It's kind of in our DNA. You have created us to make choices. And sometimes we choose wrongly. Sometimes we hurt other people. And so, Lord, please forgive us. Give us, give us the eyes and the heart of Jesus to understand what you have called us to. That you have given us new life and may we live out that new life with courage with Jesus as our guide. And we pray the prayer that he taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Um, invite our young people to come on up here down front. I've got a good word for you. Eli, come on, man. I'll let you hold the baby doll. 
<laughs> I call you up here just so that you can give Gabe some, uh, so he's not feeling overwhelmed by all these ladies. So, so uh, here you go. It's my baby doll. Okay, you can laugh. It's all right. <laughs> so let me ask you, has anybody here, I'll just put her down there. Has anybody here ever held a baby? Do you ever hold a baby? You guys ever hold a baby? Yeah, it's kind of, what do you think when you hold a baby? What goes through your mind when you're holding a baby? Yeah, what if I drop it? Oh my gosh, right? And even like when I had my granddaughters were little girls, I was like scared to hold them too because I'm like, man, the same thing, asking the same thing. You think of anything else as you stare down at that little baby? Anything else come to mind? You can imagine what you think if you were to hold a baby, what you would think of. You know, one of the things that I thought of was, they are so tiny, right? The baby is so small and so tiny. Look at the little nose and the little, you look at their fingers, you know, a little little itty bitty fingers, they're so tiny. Um, and sometimes you think, like if, it, if you're a parent and you hold a child, or even a grandparent, you look, hold a little child, you think, I wonder what they're going to grow up to become. What are they gonna be like, you know? And, and so many children, they grow up, they're different. So, um, like those curls, huh? So let me ask you this question. What do we what do we celebrate at Christmas? Jesus being born. So Jesus was a baby. Okay? Um, and we, we think about Jesus, you know, being in a manger and everything like that. And I want you to think for a minute. Let's think for a minute. If I could put you in a time machine and you went back to the time when Jesus was born and Mary took baby Jesus and she put him in your arms to hold the baby Jesus. What do you think you would think of? Who exists? Because you would kind of know who he is, right? You'd be like, oh my gosh. And maybe you'd start thinking about this baby is going to grow up to do what? Heal people. Oh my gosh, I'm holding this person who's going to grow up to heal people. And then even think about going on the cross and dying and, and resurrected. This baby will be dead and he'll be resurrected. One of those interesting stories that we read about. So there are people in the Bible, the story in the Bible with Mary and Joseph when they had the baby Jesus. He was just a week old and they took him to church. Um, the temple to bless, to offer him to God and say, God, um, thank you for this child. And they made a sacrifice. And while they were there, some people came up to Mary and Joseph. And God had told them beforehand that they said, um, they told them that the baby, the Messiah is there. This is a special baby and he's going to grow up and he's going to lead, he's going to lead the people um, out of slavery, out of, he's going to lead the people to freedom. And, and there are two persons, an old person by the name of Simeon, and then another person by the name of Anna. And they knew, they had, God gave them special insight on who this little baby was that Mary and Joseph were holding and so they start telling me, this, is going, this, guy, this child is going to grow up to be the Messiah. It's going to be awesome. And so it's kind of neat. Now, here's the other thing. You guys were this small at one time too, right? It's hard to imagine that. But you were actually, somebody actually held you. And your parents probably wondered, I wonder what this little child of mine, this little girl, this little boy, I wonder what they're going to grow up to become. Do you know that as God looks at you now, in the Bible, God says that we are his children. 
And so God looks at each one of you and he just, God just kind of goes, <laughs> he gets so excited. In fact, here's what the apostle Paul said. This is awesome. He said, we are God's masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So sometimes you feel down, sometimes you feel sad, sometimes you don't feel as good as you think that you are, right? But I always want you to remember that as God's child, God looks at you and says, you are a masterpiece. Can we say that together? Can we say I, say, I am a masterpiece together? Let's say it on three. Ready? One, two, three. I am a masterpiece. Now, do you really mean it? So we need to say it again like you really mean it. Because I want you guys to remember this. Ready? Okay? Let's say it again. And maybe you can shout it, and then everybody else will say it too. Ready? One, two, three. I am a masterpiece. Awesome. God, thank you for these children. May they, may they never forget that you have created them as a masterpiece, and may they live that out to do good works for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Thank you, Ken and Niani, for leading us in worship this morning. <clears throat> I want to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 2 in your Bibles. Luke chapter 2, page 832, 832 in your Red Pew Bibles. We're going to be in the book of Luke now for a while. We started this back in December as we covered the birth of Jesus. <clears throat> and now uh, we, we took a break, and now we're going to pick it up afterwards. Um, Luke chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 22. Um, people are complaining these days about our presidential candidates 
for a variety of reasons, but one of the things that they say about them is that they're too old. <laughs> These guys are too old, right? And, and whenever they both, um, either one of them stumble or they misspeak in public, the media just jumps all over and says, eh, these guys are too old, you know. And people have been saying for a while, kind of looking at other, part, can, or other uh, uh, parties, you know, we don't want old guys. We want a new and a fresh look. We, we want a different kind of president is what people are saying. We're tired of the same old thing that we've had for the past couple of years. And as Luke begins writing these first couple chapters here, he's introducing the world to Jesus Christ. And Jesus is a different kind of king. He's not like the other kings that most of the people are familiar with, like King Herod or Caesar. Jesus is radically different. And so Luke's going to show us this here as he, as he started off. He already did in chapter 1 and first part of chapter 2. Now um, he continues to do that. So uh, we're going to pick it up in verse 2. Let's pray before we begin, okay? God, we thank you for this time of worship that we've had. It is just wonderful and beautiful to sing to you and just to be reminded of who you are. Now we will do that as we jump into your word. And Lord, as we do so, we, I ask that you would just open up our eyes and open up our minds that um, we might see the scripture and in, in what you want us to see, what you want us to get out of it. Lord, that you might meet our needs. Lord, that you might draw us closer to yourself with the end goal of becoming like your son, Jesus Christ. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, Luke chapter 2, we'll start in verse 22. It says, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses... Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised you may now dismiss your servant in peace. He said, I am ready to die. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Verse 30, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them. And said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. And she had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. And she never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. And when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. And God bless the reading of his word. 
In beginning to tell the story of King Jesus, Luke starts off chapter 1 mentioning King Herod. And then in chapter 2, he talks about Caesar, Caesar Augustus. And then uh, if you recall the Christmas story, he talked about uh, that the Caesar had required that a, a, uh, a tax, that a census would be taken. And the reason why you have censuses, if that's a plural word, I don't know. The reason why you have a census is so that you can tax people, so you could gather money. So it's a reminder. Luke is starting off here writing and reminding the people that, hey, there's, you know, there's a king, there's Caesar, and we know how kings act. They act super wealthy. They tax people all the time. They like to throw their weight around. There's some brutality, with, especially with the Roman soldiers that these people would see everywhere. Uh, there was a reminder about how brutal this Roman Empire was. And they favored their own people. If you were a Roman citizen, you were favored. If you weren't, there's a good chance that they could re require you to do anything. And when the Romans went and conquered people, they often took them as slaves back to their homeland and used them to construct things. So people hated. The people hated the rulers. But Luke tells us that this is a different kind of king. This King Jesus is different. First of all, he says he's not from royalty, right? If you recall the Christmas story, this King Jesus was born into poverty. His, his parents were, you know, he was laid in a manger. The parents, as they go to the temple to dedicate him, uh, to dedicate him to God, they, they um, only can afford the lowest possible uh, priced to dedicate, and that is two simple doves. They, they're in poverty. We think of the story when the, you know, when the announcement of Jesus, the first, when Jesus, the angels announced to the shepherds, the shepherds were the lowest uh, class of society, right? And they are the first ones to hear this awesome news about Jesus. And so one of the first things that Luke is telling us about this new king is that he identifies with the lower classes of people. He identifies with the poor, unlike any other king that they've known. A couple of weeks ago when Diana and I were in Europe, we had the opportunity to see this uh, wonderful uh, Pieta by Michelangelo, 500 years old. That was, it was you know, like back in 1499 is when he had carved this thing. Um, and it's a picture of Mary holding Jesus after he was taken down off of the cross. Incredible, incredible sculpture from, uh, from sculpted out of marble. And we recall the words of Simeon where he said here, uh, Mary, a sword will pierce your own soul too. And he's explaining to Mary that you will experience pain and suffering because you will see your child experience pain and suffering. And so another thing that Luke is telling us about this new king is that he's going to be familiar with suffering. He's going to know the suffering of poverty and opposition and pain and agony. But then Simeon also says, or it's also mentioned that Simeon had been waiting for the consolation of Israel. That Jesus is going to be, this new king is going to be the comforter of Israel. He's going to actually bring comfort to his people. Anna said, she spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of, of Jerusalem. That this boy will grow up to become a redeemer. He will set his people free. Now we know we call Jesus the redeemer. He sets us free from sin and death because of his suffering and death on the cross. And so this king is, is going to be different. He's going to bring comfort to his people. He's going to set his people free and redeem them. And then quoting Isaiah, Simeon said that this King Jesus is going to bring salvation for all nations and the Gentiles. Oh, that's new. It's not just for, he's not just for the Jewish people that he's a part of. He is for all humanity. And so Luke is showing us this King Jesus, he is different. He is unlike any other ruler who has been on the earth. And then he says in verse 34, and this is the, 
This is the verse I want to kind of look at here for a moment. He said, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel. You think when a new president comes in and takes office and he hires new staff and new cabinet and the old staff and the old cabinet, they're out, right? They, they're falling, okay? They, they're done. And then the new staff and new cabinet are raised up to serve the people. This is kind of what Luke is saying is what's going to be like with this King Jesus guy. When King Jesus comes, he is going to confront and challenge people. Some people are going to rise, some people are going to fall. I think of the religious leaders whom Jesus confronted and, and, uh, and, and as they hit heads, right, they were intent on defending the law and the temple and their traditions over and against Jesus. They couldn't see how important Jesus was. In fact, they, we know they set out to kill him. And you know what? Guess what? They definitely took a fall because 40 years after Jesus had been resurrected, the temple was destroyed by the Romans. And so that whole religious structure took a major, major hit. Think of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, good teacher, what can I do to have eternal life? And so Jesus looked at him and said, Follow the commandments and then sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. And the scripture says that this man went away sad. He was downtrodden. We, we might say that he fell because he had a lot of wealth. And he couldn't take what Jesus was saying and so he, he fell. On the other hand, we know that Jesus elevated many people in Scripture. People would come to Jesus and ask for healing, and Jesus would raise them up. Jesus would cast out demons. Jesus would enable people who were blind, and he would enable them to see. People who couldn't walk, they could walk. And so Jesus was constantly elevating people. Think of the Apostle Paul, who at one time was killing Christians, and then he encountered Jesus, and what happened? Jesus lifted him up to do a great work. And so choosing to follow King Jesus results in being lifted up. When you choose to follow Jesus, you will be lifted up. Now, what does it mean to be lifted up? Well, the first thing is that we can take that literally, okay? In Colossians 2.12, the apostle Paul wrote this, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And so one of the ways we can be lifted up is literally we will be lifted up. One day we will be resurrected like Jesus. And that we put our faith in God and Trusting Jesus means that in the future, when our life is over here on this earth, we will be lifted up out of this pain and suffering and grief into a resurrected life with Jesus. If there are people alive in there, out there, this is a statement where you say, amen, right? I mean, yes, right? I, every once in a while, I need to wake you up. So let that be a wake up moment, okay? But it's not just the future. It's not just, oh, okay, yeah, one day I'll be lifted up and we'll go to heaven. It is now. 1 Peter 5, 6. Peter writes this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. And so what he's saying is that when we humble ourselves, when we surrender our life to Jesus Christ, God will exalt us. God will lift us up. God will honor us. He gives us a new life. He'll give us a new outlook on life. He'll give us a whole new mindset. He's lifting us up in our, even in our thinking. We can become the best version of ourselves as we are created as a human being. That when we humble ourselves before God, we become the best version of ourselves. Remember the old army ad? Right? Join the army. Become all you can be. Right? That's what Jesus offers us. That's what Jesus offers us. I think this is my favorite verse in all the Bible, and I think this is the most 
this kind of just, to me, it explains what Jesus is all about. And that's John 10, 10. And Mark, you put it up on the screen. This, this, is, this is just an awesome message. And Jesus said this, I came so that people could have real and eternal life, more and better life than you ever dreamed of. Now, he's not just saying, Jesus didn't tell people, hey, I've come so you can go to heaven. That's included. Jesus came today so that we could have real life. More and better life than we ever dreamed of right now in whatever situation that you are. Jesus wants to lift us up to that life. That's what he wants to do for us, to become the best possible version as a human being the way God had created us. Jesus came so that we could live that out. That's available to everyone. Now, on the other hand, Simeon also said this, this child is destined to cause the falling of many in Israel. That this King Jesus is going to cause a lot of people to fall. That people will reject what this king is offering. And so we might say choosing not to follow King Jesus and his way results in being brought low. I shared with um, the church this week on my e-news about my encounter with a church member as I went to her place to visit and she told me, I can't visit you right now because I'm, my computer's being hacked. And I said, oh, you know, and she was on the phone with him. And the long story short, you can go back and read the e-news from last week. If you don't have our e-news, talk to me and I'll set you up with getting our e-news. But I was able to convince her that that was a scam that was going on. And we resolved she didn't lose any money like she thought, and everything was cool, and everything settled down. But I spent the rest of the afternoon thinking, I was so angry. And I get angry when there are people out there that take advantage of people who are vulnerable. vulnerable. Whether that's young people, whether that's old people, that just kind of gets me. And what do we say about people like that, right? How can people stoop so low? That's what we say. And we talk about people like that who, are, who resort to violence and who are base and vulgar and low. And people who reject Jesus and his teachings become less than what God has designed them to be. They become less than what God has designed them to be. Talking about the ways of God... The writer Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 8, he said, God will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah. He will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured that they'll be brought low. When we don't follow the ways of God and the way the teachings of Jesus, it messes us up. It messes us up and we end up doing, as I like to say, we end up doing stupid stuff. We end up saying stupid stuff. And you know what? Life becomes a trap. We end up getting snared and we stumble and we feel broken. Right? We're not at the top of our game. We're not filled with that joy of Jesus because we haven't followed him. We've, we've done our own thing and we've messed it up. So we feel like just mess, we feel messed up. Matthew chapter 23, Jesus said his, to his disciples, if you put yourself above others, you will be put down. But if you humble yourself, you will be honored. Luke is showing us that the way of King Jesus is one that puts other people first. 
If we're not going to do that, if we're going to live life focusing on ourselves, we live a life focusing on ourselves, then Jesus is not king. And when we do that, we're putting ourselves first and focusing life on ourselves. Scripture says that we're going to end up being put down. And so choosing to reject the ways of King Jesus results in being brought low. And we won't. If we're being brought low, we cannot experience that abundant and full life that Jesus had promised us. In the beautiful weather this week, I was sitting out on my back patio reading. It was 75 degrees. It was nice. I was sitting there reading and just taking it in watching the birds, listening to the bees. I had this one bee that's buzzing all around me, you know. But then this guy got kind of close. You know, he's like, Bzzz. he's buzzing up in my face. Now, usually I just leave him go because like, oh, you know, leave the bees alone. They're nice, you know, and they go away. This guy wouldn't go away. So he's like, Bzzz. you know, this is like, whoa, too close for comfort. It's like, <laughs> you know, it just swat him away right? I think this is what Luke says about what this new King Jesus is like. In verse 34, he said, this child will be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And it's almost like Luke is letting the reader know here in the beginning of the book before this adult teacher Jesus wrote you know, grows up. He's letting us know on what this King Jesus is going to do. He's going to go straight to our hearts and he's going to be in our face. This King is going to get personal with you. This King is a polarizing figure. You, you can't ignore him. And he is going to challenge each one of us. And you're going to have to make a decision about this guy. As we go through Luke, you're going to notice this. These words of Jesus is going to be like a bee buzzing in our face, right? And, and you, it's a good chance that as, as, as I explain these words, you're going to get angry with me, right? Don't get angry with me, right? Because Luke is different than the other gospel writers. Luke is more of a get-in-your-face sort of guy because he's showing us this one thing about King Jesus here, he demands a response. William Barclay is a writer. He said this, toward Jesus Christ, there can be no neutrality. We either surrender to him or are at war with him. And it is the tragedy of life that our pride often keeps us from making that surrender which leads to victory, which leads to us getting raised up in Jesus Christ. Folks, I'm not talking about a one-time deal, which most of us have probably made in here. We made it younger or whenever it was when we decided that I'm going to make Jesus Christ my Savior and Lord of my life. Like we've chosen one time, and I remember I did it back in eighth grade. And I make Jesus, he's, you know, yes, Jesus is my Savior, and I chose Jesus like I chose him, oh, over any other religion that out there. Oh, yes, I'll take Jesus. He's the best. But what we're talking about today is that every decision that we make in life, Jesus is going to be there. Do that, follow me or not. Follow me here or not. And the thing about Jesus, it's not like he's a cop. We think like Jesus is a cop. Like if we don't follow Jesus, go to jail. Or, or we say bad stuff is going to happen. But Jesus says, follow me. I'll lift you up and give you the best possible life that you can imagine. Would you bow your heads, please? I want to invite you just, because I think God's going to speak to each one of us in, in an area of your life that you know that you need to surrender to Jesus. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about surrendering to Jesus. 
And so I'll give you some time of silence. What is God saying to you? Okay, what are you going to do about it? Tell God deep in your heart what you are going to do about what he has showed you. Father God, we, we see Jesus in a number of different ways. Around Christmas time, we see him, see him as the baby. We see Jesus as that loving savior and comforter and meek and mild. But we also know that Jesus can confront us and challenge us to bring about the best version of us that God has created for us. He wants to pull that out of us so that we can experience an abundant and full life. Lord, may we not run from that challenge, but may we accept it and begin to make changes in our life so that we can experience, we can experience the joy of Jesus and the presence of Jesus in our life. And just enjoy life to the fullest. God, would you give us eyes to see and hearts to understand what you're calling us to? Give us courage to surrender our lives because that calls for change. And that's hard. And so, Lord, give us strength. We ask your Holy Spirit to continue to remind us what you want, what you have for us. And we pray that your Spirit would strengthen us so that we can make these changes and become more like your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Folks, I always like to, you know, this is, this is the, the time when we, you know, when, when significant changes are made, right? And so I encourage you to share them with me, share them with somebody, even folks online, to uh, send me an email. We want to pray for you. We want to help you through this. Uh, because here's what happens. You can say, it is so easy to say anything here uh, during this time in the quietness, and you make all these promises to God, and then you go up and have a cup of coffee and a donut, and it goes right out the window. And so, the, you know, talk to somebody. Come to me and just say, Greg, I'm, I'm going to make this change in my life. Would you pray for me? We have a prayer team that will pray for you. So I encourage you to do that. Don't stop, okay? Don't stop at just right what you said here. Keep it going couple announcements that we have. Uh, just a few announcements, which I don't have my announcement sheet, but I have it, is uh, just next week we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. And so uh, I hope that you can join us for that. And I invite everybody to join us for, uh, for those coffee and donuts. Actually, it's been upgraded from coffee and donuts because Peggy, <laughs> Peggy and Greta are in there. Uh, and they got a nice spread. So we invite you to come on over there and um, uh, just enjoy a time of fellowship. And then to stick around for some Bible study. Uh, we invite you to do that as well uh, as, as we just seek to, to make our roots in the faith deeper. So um, stand up. Stand up.
go in peace for your eyes have seen the salvation which God has prepared for all people grow and strengthen wisdom and bring forth a harvest of righteousness and praise and may God smile upon you and make you strong and wise may Christ Jesus share his inheritance with you freely and may the Holy Spirit open your eyes to the presence of God's Messiah amen Go in peace. Have a great week, everyone. God bless.